Today, so anytime you can have spare time, I want to spend it here. I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, my name is Matt Bakes. I'm the owner uh, of Triumph Rescue uh, British Wiring. I didn't want to step in the dust. We in, we'll, we'll interrupt each other constantly, which is kind of good. But. Uh, uh, my name is Matt Bakes. I'm the owner of Triumph Rescue British Wiring. We have a little business called Valley Auto Care where we work on new cars. We have our state inspection license and we do a lot of other stuff. So, uh, we've been in business, just a real quick history, I don't want to bore everybody. Uh, we've been in business for about 25 years now. Uh, we started in a little three car garage over here, a couple miles away from here. We just built it about 12, uh, maybe 15 years ago. And, uh, from there, we've just uh, kept growing uh, because of, well, you guys, because of our customers. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of work, and I'm very fortunate to have that kind of work, so I don't take any of that for granted. Uh, we, I'd like to introduce our crew, if I could. They're kind of scattered around, but um, we have Bob over there in the white shirt. Bob does our, our painting, body guy. <laughs> So if you see a run in your paint, that's, that's the guy. Uh, we also have Brian over here. Brian's a new hire. He, uh, he's been here for about a month. Brian, uh, Brian also does body and paint. He came from NASCAR. Um, I don't think he can divulge any secrets, but uh, he, uh, he's very talented and uh, uh, I, you know, just on a side note from that, the labor market is so tight right now, it's almost impossible to find people. So when you can find somebody competent, uh, you got to hire them. So thank you, Brian. Uh, next to him is Rob. Rob is, uh, <laughs> Rob does uh, mechanical work for us. He's a good troubleshooter. Uh, he's very fun to be around. Uh, there's a little bit of sparring, uh, sparring that goes on here uh, from time to time, so it's kind of it's kind of neat when I start calling them the other guy by their wives' names. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one will say, "Okay, okay Tiff. Jill. Okay, Jill." <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we also have Shane. Shane is one of our mechanics. I was supposed to tell everybody that Shane is uh, in charge of customer relations. So, so if, you're lucky to get, if you're lucky enough to get Shane on the phone, uh, he, 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 he really, he has a ton of patience. So, uh, he does a great job. Uh, we have another guy, uh, Kale, who's not here today. He does a lot of our welding, uh, TIG and MIG and so forth and so on. Um, does some of our fab work. Uh, then I have Josh who does British wiring. He's uh, Josh is a little shy, so um, he's still making the fun. <laughs> Josh is called me. Um, if you really want to bug Josh, you can kind of every, as everybody leaves, you can kind of go through that little office back there and just say hi. That will make his day. Uh, then uh, Mike oh, here. Josh is going. That's Josh. <laughs> Josh does British wiring for us. So uh, he's the guy that call British wiring. Get him on the phone. Uh, he's also uh, very patient. I've heard some of his phone calls talking to uh, different customers. So he's, he uh, does it. He's very patient. <laughs> As you can imagine. Uh, now the next one. Oh, Mike. <laughs> Mike works for us part time. Uh, he's our uh, uh, resident electrical guru. Uh, he's uh, 
very good at troubleshooting, and uh, you know, as we all know, we're almost always doing something electrical at some point in time. So, but on the same token, it's just it's a daunting task sometimes. <laughs> but uh, so there's Mike, and that's our. Uh, did I get everybody? Beth. So. Beth. Oh, the trash. <laughs> <laughs> My wife Beth, she's uh, a funny quick story about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> deeper. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer to dig it both ends. Uh, way back when, when uh, we were starting, things were progressing and so forth and so on. Uh, and, and Beth came on board. I, I was telling people that Beth worked for me. And uh, I was soon corrected. And she said, well, we work together. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, my wife I'll be very honest with you. When a you know what hits a fan, there is nobody standing behind me. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, she does a great job. Um, she does the bookkeeping and uh, She's also, uh, she doesn't know it really, but she's in charge of customer relations too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Shane's job. <laughs> you <laughs> delegated it to you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, also I need to thank uh, uh, my Lydia. daughter Libby, uh, did some of the food preparation. My granddaughter, uh, what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> we call her Elle. Her name is Ella, but uh, we call her Elle. Um, she told me we have to give something away today. And uh, so anyway, she's giving everybody a number. If somebody doesn't have a number, just raise your hand and we'll get you a number. Uh, and I think that is, I think I'm okay. Am I okay now? Yep. Okay. Uh, I thought what we do is uh, just go over some essentials. You know, we basically, we've been doing, uh, uh, We've been doing this for such a long time that I think we've talked just about every subject to uh, uh, the bushes. But it's good to go over this stuff once a year. We, uh, so I thought what I'd do real quick is just go over some essentials. Um, in fact, Charlie Frick went over, um, he posted something the other day on uh, Delaware Valley Triumph's website of me at one of our old tech sessions at the old garage. And the guy in there, was Jack Bow, and he worked for Lucas. And that's why I had him in there. That was that guy in a shirt and tie. It was kind of off the side. Uh, Jack worked for Lucas, had some great stories. But that had to be, I think you're right, that had to be 20. I think it was 2000. Yeah. So it was almost 20 years ago. So, uh, and we only had like, what is it, like 20. Maybe there's 25 people there at that point in time. I don't remember. It looked pretty small. That disc was just a mystery disc. I don't know who took those photos from back then, but uh, it's got a whole year of events for DVT from 2000. And it's, thank you for all these years of uh, sharing yeah, knowledge. It's pretty funny when I think about it, because this time we had, uh, and this isn't a shameless plug. I guess it's not too much shameless. Um, I was taking uh, RSVPs for everybody. We had 100 pre-registered people, which is kind of amazing to me in a way. And I was really starting to get nervous, to be honest with you, because I didn't know. I wanted to make sure we were going to have enough food and seats, because we rented 100 seats. And it's just, as you can see, there's people standing. So, uh, but anyway, long story short. Uh, so, essentials. Uh, we all know the fuel today with the ethanol and so forth and so on. Uh, there's some additives out there. There's also some uh, ethanol-free gas stations that are scattered around that are very good if they're in your area. I know for, for me, um, uh, we have a house in New York State, but long story short, my wife's car, she has a TR4. We keep it up there. 
and but there's a marina right there. So I usually take her car down to the marina and put gas in it. It works out great. But we're right in that area, so it's very, very easy for us to do. There are some additives out there. We we have it, and this is, you know, they're stable. There's any number of different uh, additives out there, but we use this stuff called Driven. It's uh, it works out very well. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. This is this is like an opinion, so I don't. There's any number of different things out there that people can use, but this is just something we use. Um, and taking a step back from that, do you want to talk about carburation, or should we? Because that's part of this fuel thing. Or yeah. I was going to go into basically because there's no pizzazz in the gas today. <laughs> Most of our cars were designed to run on like 90, 96, that, that actually part of the lead that we're going to talk about, but go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm going to steal some of his thunder. Uh, <laughs> Wouldn't be the first. I know. <laughs> but it's my shop. It's my, Rob calls it my sandbox. This is my sandbox. So when we get into like a little tiff about, not necessarily a tiff, but we, when, we, when we talk about things, he's, he's talking about moving stuff in the shop, and I'm like, what do you want to do that? Oh, that's right, it's your shop. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we, uh, most of our cars were designed to run on like 90, 96, 98, even, even higher octane. Well, today you can't get that. Um, it's around, but I, I, I don't know whether you could just, it's like 90, what is it, 93, what is it, 93? So there's no pizzazz in the gas today, which means, and which means we have to adjust the cars to run on the crappy fuel, basically, is what it means. So we're almost always adding, you know, back in the day, the cars were always running rich, and there was always that problem with fouling plugs, and you still may have that a little bit today, but what we tend to do is we tend to take the car and richen it up. So whether we're putting in different needles, uh, whether we're, you know, putting richer needles in, trying to, uh, like a TR6, trying to block off all the uh, extra uh, orifices that are in the carburetors, trying to make sure that all the air goes through there, you get the most out of your fuel. So there's there's a distinct disadvantage for all of us here. Plus the gas doesn't last very long. Within the first 30 days, it starts to deteriorate. So once you get past that point, then, and, and I'm not a big fan of, filling your gas tank in October when you're going to park the car till April because basically the, the fuel can go south in that amount of time. So now you've got a full tank of gas that is old and it's not going to have the same pizzazz. It didn't have pizzazz to start with so now it doesn't have any pizzazz. So, uh, but then you have to use that up before you can put fresh gas on top of it and try to you know, diffuse a little bit, but long story short, um, I like to just put enough gas in there to do what I'm doing at any certain time. So I almost will never fill my tank up, and I just put, I constantly put fresh gas in it, and I think my car, uh, well her car, uh, seems to like that. So that, that's kind of the way I get around it, but Mike's going to probably talk about that a little bit more. Um, so. Do you want me to keep going? Or you go? Okay, keep going. going so, <laughs> what I, I have in front of me, so I'm, I'm gonna go through the rest of the essentials like air, spark, hydraulics, and all that other stuff. But we always say stuff at the shop, and some of the, you guys were here last year, or the year before that. We always enjoy, uh, when people bring in their cars, you, you just never know. And here's a clutch disc, and, <coughs> and the driver. So this is supposed to be like that. So the guy called and said, hey, I'm having, uh, I'm having problems with my clutch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously it's supposed to be connected. When they're not connected, we have problems. So anyway, this is a pretty easy diagnosis. You can't diagnose this. You know, you might as well stop. So that's it. So we have this one here. So a lot of you will recognize this. This is a TR6 downpipe gasket. Well, instead of putting it 
the way it was supposed to be in, they turn it because it's 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 a it's basically a square. You put it in both ways. So the customer called and said he's having problems with the it just the motor doesn't have any pizzazz. Well, that's because you blocked half the exhaust off. <laughs> so that was also that, but that was interesting trying to find that one. Then we had oh, we had uh, another TR6 story. Uh, oh, I should have taken the customer's name off. This is an intake exhaust manifold gasket that was on a TR6. Well, they made two different exhaust, you know, intake exhaust gaskets for the TR6. And it's hard to see, so when you guys want to come up and look at this after the fact. Well, he put like a late on an earlier, early on a late, but the problem is he blocked half the stuff off all the way across, and his car wasn't running right. So, we have, uh, we have all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, this is, you probably remember this from last year. This is, uh, this is gas tank sealer. And this, this came out of a TR3, this looks like old elephant skin. Uh, this came out of a TR3 uh, that the customer was saying that he had a problem with his, uh, his car was running out of gas. So, you know, I look in there, obviously, you're going to look in the, the hole, and it's like, what the hell was that floating around in there? So, when this was in the gas, it was very pliable, and I, I pulled this out of the, uh, the fill pipe on the TR3. I just I kept drawing it out. It was like a, uh, well, I don't want to say what it was. But, so, <laughs> you're drawing this stuff out, and it's like, wow, man. So, this, this was in a TR3, and this was, he, he did the gas tank lining. <clears throat> Liner, he didn't follow directions, I assume, and uh, so that's what you get. But um, there are some good. I usually send our gas tanks out to be cleaned and then coated. But so this is what can happen, and this this is not that <coughs> not unordinary for this. Uh, what else? Just uh, some of the stuff you won't be able to see. I we do a lot of transmission work here. And this is a great bag if you guys ever get a chance to come up here. I was rebuilding a TR6 transmission for a, a customer. And there was, I don't know whether you can see it, but this is a, this is a drill bit. <laughs> and, and, you know, this, this was inside the transmission. Inside the transmission. You know, it's great. It just, because you never ever think you're going to see, you think that you're never going never gonna to be surprised. And you pull out a, a broken drill bit. And then when you look at the transmission, though, there's no other hole. There was no hole, no how that got in there. You know, I mean, physically, just, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you got a bunch of other stuff. Uh, oh, that's just dirt. Oh, this is probably pretty good, too. We do a lot of, uh, you know, customer will call up and say his gas um, <coughs> unit doesn't work anymore. And he's, well, these plastic... Um, levels, uh, uh, floats, they fill up with fuel. So when they fill up with fuel, they sink. So uh, it's interesting, you know, it makes us look like rocket scientists, but you know, you, you get out there, you, you put a new uh, float in there, and the sending unit works great. Uh, oh, this is a good one too. Customer's trying to make his bowl work better. So we actually soldered a wire onto the bowl. <laughs> so he was having a grounding issue. <laughs> I think that's great. That, that's innovative. innovative. Yeah, it's, it's, it's totally you know. Uh, what else do we have in your neck? I don't want to bring you right Just the same old, same old. We we do a lot of we do a lot of stuff. But the other one is too. This is a uh, this is a fuel level sending unit. I think this came out of a TD. But long story short, fuel light. And uh, of course it won't move. You know, it's been an old gas trailer. So that's, you know, that's pretty normal. Uh, and they sorted the spark plugs. You know, it's, these are too small to really show, but it's, it's always interesting. They're broken. They twist. Somebody, you know, they have a miss. Uh, even the you know even the brass floats some of our SUs uh, these will have a small seep in there and they fill up with fuel and then they yeah this one still has fuel um, so they don't work anymore but at any rate 
Uh, normally, if we go from fuel, we go to air. Normally, air is not an issue because you know it's it's yeah pretty much out there, right? <laughs> uh, what we do find though sometimes is the the motor isn't plumbed right, and that can cause an issue in itself. But um, you know, air is not the issue. There's a whole bunch of different uh, air cleaners out there. I don't really have any recommendations um, on that. Spark. Spark is important. Uh, I usually like to tune up our cars once a year, but it, um, you know, ignition, we've got cap rotors, plugs. Um, we use, most of the time we use champions here. The cars just seem to work better. For, for me, they, I, I think they work better. Uh, it was, a lot of our cars is what it was called for. Um, we use these red rotors. Uh, this guy Jeff in Minnesota, uh, was it uh, distributors? Uh, advanced yeah, advanced distributor does a very good job. Um, we used to tune up a customer's car and throw a couple rotors in there, just because I knew the old Lucas rotors would die before you got to the end of the block. So I gave him a couple rotors in his glove box. Glove box. But long story short, these work very good. Um, you know, the parts today, um, I was having a discussion with Ken from k and is here today, and um, we both do the same thing, but uh, it's, the, the parts today are not as good as they used to be, and... Not that they were ever super great to be <laughs> They were good enough. <laughs> yeah. But you know, we, we put a, we put a, like, let's say a slave cell, you put it on an MGB. Not rocket science. You just put it on there and leave it out, and it's good to go. Well, you know that slave cylinder could last, could last a year, could last two years, could last whatever. You know, you just it, the the quality is just not there. And then you you uh, and I don't know how the do-it-yourselfers do this sometimes because it would have to be very frustrating for me. Uh, you buy the part, you have a Saturday, you have a little bit of time to work on it and then nothing works. It just doesn't fit, it's not made properly, and you know, you're back to square one. Uh, the same thing happens here in that you, know, you buy parts, you have them, you put them in the car, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but it can be very frustrating when you're, because the bottom line is we have to guarantee everything we do. So if you're putting a part in somebody's car and it doesn't work, you're gonna take that part out again and you're gonna put it in, you call Moss, they're going to say, well, we'll guarantee the part, but they don't guarantee any labor. So you end up having to redo that. But, so parts are a, a definite uh, issue today. Uh, we normally take our spark plugs and we'll gap them a little bit higher. So if, uh, let's say, well, that's one of those weird things. Uh, if, let's say it calls for 25, we normally gap them to 28, it makes the uh, spark a little bit hotter, and it actually will make it better, I think, it makes it better. Um, so you could do that to get a little bit more. It makes the makes coil work uh, a little bit harder too, so that's not a bad thing. Um, so that's, that's spark. Um, hydraulics, uh, and this is basically, I'm just going through this list real quick to see what, um, Everybody should do this every year. You know, just take a look at your car before you start to drive it. Take a look at all this stuff. Make sure the ethanol fuel today is um, is very hard on the older style rubber. We use. Uh, I'll let you look at this, but this is um, we're constantly replacing fuel line here. Uh, uh, the ethanol, the alcohol, and the fuel will start to attack the rubber, and it's not uncommon that um, we'll get stuff that's split, cracked. Um, and it's hard as nails, uh, so uh, it, it's a good idea to look at that. It, it, if you haven't replaced it, it would be a great idea to replace that stuff. We use a fuel injection hose here, and uh, it works very well. It's it doesn't get attacked by the ethanol, but let's say you know TR threes, TR sixes. Some of the other cars, they have rubber connect connections in the fuel line underneath the car. They're not very hard, but you know, 
it's very easy to just not think about them because they're just there and they've been there for the last 50 years. But it will take its toll eventually. So, you know, we just try to get people to look at that stuff and make sure that if it hasn't been replaced, replace it. Uh, certainly the brake system, it's not a bad idea to maybe uh, change your fluid once in a while, your brakes. Um, we have we have customers that come in here and they still have their original hoses on their car. Uh, brake hoses, clutch hoses. And the funny thing is, you know, they're they're actually almost big back, but you know, they're like an artery, they close up inside. But um, so that they're they're not bad, they don't leak, but what happens is they close up inside and then they start to have problems. So um, we we change out and the hoses has I don't think we've had too many problems with the hoses. They seem to be they seem to be okay, but at the same token, we all we, we change a lot of hoses here because it's just something where you know they, they've been around forever and it just makes sense to to change them out. Mm -hmm. uh, Excuse me, Matt. Yes. Are you a fan of the stainless steel cladded hoses? The kind of the braiding ones. I you know I have I have really no preference. I'll be very honest with you. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I, I don't personally. I don't think there's anything wrong with just nice, fresh new rubber. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there could be a, a, an advantage to that, but um, well, most of us when they sell it, they tell you it's going to help keep the hose from expanding. Yeah, you know, thousand right. pounds of pressure. I don't even know if that works. The only thing is, thirty years down the road, are they going to be? You know, and that's the. The time will tell. Unfortunately, yeah, you figure the last one. Send me a letter. You figure the last one. Probably the more rest than me, right? It's more than me than I know. So, yeah, I mean, we've been installing them already. Um, they're supposed to definitely be an upgrade over the rubber as far as I've seen them slowing up, blowing out. Um, and we haven't really had any problems with them. Yeah, per se. But on the same token, they still um, go bad inside. They, they can, <laughs> obviously. Um, you know, nothing, unfortunately. <coughs> nothing cool in November. But, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, I've been here going on 12 years, and the, the rubber hoses I've replaced, even being prior to being here, for brake hoses and clutch hoses, normally once you replace them, you're pretty much guaranteed another 10, 15 years without generally any issue. Now, obviously, there can be defects stuff like that, but the biggest thing is keeping an eye on the uh, toxicity of the, the brake fluid. If it gets contaminated with moisture over time, that's the biggest thing that gets overlooked, you know, and unfortunately it takes a toll on aluminum items like aluminum uh, wheel cylinders, which basically a lot of the Triumphs use, um, and also the, the, the bores of the calipers, stuff like that, also the master cylinders, so it's always a good idea as maintenance. They actually recommend them, it's like every two years, to flush them. They do have the strips too to check the, you know, to see what the condition of the, the brake fluid is. Um, it takes 30 seconds to check it. Or if it's getting really brown, so what starts to happen is it deteriorates the rubbers, and that's when you have your failures. You know, that's that. Honestly, you see that more so than a brake coat as well. I'm sorry, not the, Take away from you there. Hey, what, what do you yeah. think about uh, two things? Yes, sir. Number one, getting like uh, when your calipers and things like that, getting them sleeved with like stainless. You know, there's a couple of companies that do it, white yeah. paste and whatnot. And the other thing, when you're talking about ignition at all, what about going to the breakerless ignitions like petroleum like and things like that? They're they're good. Um, like anything, it's not bulletproof. Uh, unfortunately, you can see electronics fail not all the time, nothing like that. Um, but it, it, it's like anything. I mean, you're, you're asking a lot of work out of a little set of points and condensers. You're asking a lot of work out of electronics. So, I mean, uh, yeah, occasionally we do have, you know, obviously some that you know, will fail or act up. Uh, overall, I mean, you know, it's not a bad idea, especially if you don't want to be bothered with, you know, adjusting points, you know, or to sugar has a little bit of wear. Electronics is a good, you know, good item to put in. Um, yeah, but overall, you know, yeah, it's making pretty good results. You know, like I said, occasionally you have an issue, but you can have about anything. And then, uh, as far as sleeping uh, the brake calipers, you know, I, I guess when we have them rebuilt, you know, occasionally they can be sleeved. Yeah, but I don't um, see the point of doing a brake caliper because the seal is in the caliper. Yeah. 
and the seal is on the piston. So yeah, if there's a problem there, you simply replace the piston. No, no the reason I was asking that is, as you were saying that, a lot of the new parts aren't really nearly as good as the originals. Uh, I had replaced the, uh, the, the, the safe cylinders on the rear brakes and drum brakes on my Morgan, and the, the new ones just didn't fit. So I had to send the originals out and get them sleeved. <coughs> as sleeving, ultimately sleeving is, is fine. It just it, it basically puts the, the cylinder back into spec. The flip side of that is you're still putting rubber in there as you were, you know, your your mean of seal. So it it's great to put the cylinder back into spec, but it doesn't necessarily negate the fact that you're going to have the rubber eventually will deteriorate because mm -hmm. the rubber. And I'm I'm not a he's an engineer. I'm not. But um, <coughs> rubber today is not the same. It just doesn't. It, it doesn't doesn't hold up as well. It um, you know we we see it that um, uh, all those little funky bushings that you put in the front end and all that stuff that we're taking out bushings that really aren't they're they're bad they're worn out but in the back of my mind I'm thinking that the new ones we're going to install aren't necessarily that good as well so it's a it's a you know, <coughs> You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But we also will send, it, depending on the job, we'll send out stuff to have it resleeved. And ultimately, it's um, uh, if you want that original part that's going to, you know, it's going to fit first off. But if you want that original part, it's a, it, and it's in the budget. It's a great way to to get that accomplished. So. Are they making any of these seals out of modern materials like silicone or some of the synthetic rubbers or anything like that? Will they hold up better? Uh, it's going to be a synthetic rubber to begin with. Any, any particularly in brake systems, they're going to be, it's going to be a synthetic rubber. I don't think that anybody makes natural rubber seals anymore for British cars. It used to be the case, but not. Yeah. It'll be more modern material, you know. Like a fuel rubber or uh, there's another one too, and I can't think of what it is right off there. But uh, yeah, there, there are rubbers that are specifically designed to work with brake fluid, and that's what's going to have to be specified. Otherwise, it's just going to turn basically into chewing gum. And that's not a seal. Are the racing communities using the newer stuff? You know, is that you know, I don't, I don't have answer for that. Yeah, I don't follow that so much. So, um, I on the same subject though, um, if you, and it, it's hard for me to read the directions too sometimes, but if you buy a master cylinder, whatever, in, in the little pamphlet that they put in there, it says do not use silicone. They will not guarantee the part if you use silicone. So, and, and I'm not a big fan of silicone, although I, it, it works. Um, if it ever gets on your tools, if it ever gets on the floor, it doesn't need paint. So that's that's great. It doesn't need paint, but it, it's I find it very difficult to work with. It, it's hard to get it bled, and it, it'll leak out of every possible orifice that's around. It just it, we can have a standard brake fluid car. And it doesn't leak. We had an MGA in here that drove us crazy. Any <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just, for whatever reason, it just, standard fluid did not leak. Silicone, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I'm not a, I don't even know what to call it. Plus, you also got to watch if the vehicle has vacuum brakes. The silicone fluid mm -hmm. can actually be sucked up into the engine over time. That's one thing, you know, if you even Google it, you know, there's actually forums on that. Um, you know, when I was restoring my, uh, I had one before, and I was, one thing I was considering is running silicone fluid, and I actually opted away from it, because if that starts burning that in your engine, if it gets sucked up past the master cylinder in through the brake booster, which means silicone will leak where regular brake fluid won't, because the molecules are very, very small, um, it can actually cause adverse effects to the engine. I mean, you're not going to, yeah, I'm not saying you know, not to run silicone, but if you are going to run silicone, you definitely want to make sure that you have a very good sound braking system to begin with. Yeah, as far as, and I know Ron might contradict with me on that, so he's silicone and lumber in there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, there are also uh, some pretty big procedures to flush out the system if you were going to do that. Yeah. You know, I
know, it's not uncommon to find uh, brake fluid in your booster anyway. You know, as the seals start to wear, people will, will have an issue with their, uh, they can't keep, they're losing brake fluid, but they can't figure out where it's going. Well, if the seal starts to go in the back or the front of the booster, you'll actually suck. I mean, we have, we have some, we take some boosters off and you can slosh them around. I mean, there's, there's a half a quart of brake fluid in there. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's another problem. But, um, um, you know, just a quick funny story. Um, we always, the other thing we tease everybody here about is there's a black chair up there by the computer. And uh, we always joke about trying to find somebody that wants to sit in that chair. And uh, I was thinking that chair's mine. But, uh, so I'm just, you know, that was good. Maybe you're trying to work over towards that black chair. <laughs> uh, Another quick question on, on yeah. bikes. We all have very old cars. Do you recommend, like, after so many years going over and replacing all the critical skills and braking system, or do you do it as needed? I, you know, it might be a little overkill to say that it's such and such a time. I'm just going to replace everything. I, I don't know whether I, I, I think being uh, proactive is probably the best thing you can do, and that's kind of what we're getting at is some of the simple maintenance stuff that, you know, just once a year or maybe twice a year, take a look at your car, pull the, pull the brakes, you know, pull the tires off, take a look at your, um, your connections, your, your brake hoses, your fuel hoses, and then that'll tell you uh, what you need to do. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, you just, you also got the turn off. No. Uh, See, what's that black chair? Yeah, I mean, I got that one. And also, like you said before, about checking the condition of the brake fluid. That condition of the brake fluid means everything for keeping the rubbers, the internal rubbers, gives them a longer life. So, like I said, a rule of thumb about every two years, um, because like I said, the brake fluid absorbs that, that moisture and becomes acidic after it can't absorb any more moisture. Like I said, you can use a test strip that's really black or brown then it's definitely a good idea to look at the change. Yes, sir. Shane, you mentioned those tests, tests just a couple yes. times. Uh, what, is there a brand of we yeah, there's some, um, uh, Phoenix makes some, you can go to just any auto parts. Yeah, any auto parts store will have their little test strips, and they'll give you a color code. Yeah, and you can basically dip it in your brake fluid, pull it out, and it'll compare, and it'll tell you. Yeah, so, like I said, changing the DOD, if you're running DOD for you, you brake fluid. Uh, like I said, that's just something you want to check into. Yeah, or silicone brake fluid is good, but it leaks and spots are GOT free one. Um, but like I said, also it doesn't absorb moisture. So if you have moisture in your system, it could drop down to the bottom or lowest point, and the moisture sitting in there over time, and it can cause corrosion down there. So like I said, again, nothing's foolproof. But as Matt said earlier, you use GOT five like. On a TR6 master cylinder, it says right on there, it'll give you a little hard with it not to use it because if it leaks, it's void the warranty. That's, uh, that's the only real big thing you gotta watch, you know, like I said, when you do it with silicon, I should say one of the big things. Is that litmus paper or does it check for acidity or something? Yes, else? it checks for acidity. Um, like I said, yeah, I mean, basically it'll turn color. Is it actually what is this copper content? Yeah. It's something that he measures. So. Copper's probably being leached out of certain connections. Yeah. You're testing for that. Yeah. And then that also helps with uh, keeping the rubber from breaking down on the internal parts of your brake hoses. Now, obviously, age and all does affect it too. But, um, but, yeah, the, but the thing of it is, is, is it, it comes to braking system and hydraulic parts, they'll give you a little warning before they just quit. Yeah. I mean, they, they'll be wet for a while before yeah, they start to go for generally P fluid. Start getting a little bit. Any other questions about? Uh, if I guess maybe I should have said during the introduction, if anybody has any questions, please just ask. There's no, there's no, whatever you guys want to ask. Good. Um, how often do you see the uh, Smith's uh, PVC valve going? The Smith's Never, there's nothing in it. Yeah, the, the, the flat PCB. PCB. The, 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 the diaphragm, in like yeah, a TR4A, diaphragm. something like that, or MGB. Yeah, like that one. It, um, it, you know, 
I think I'd have to say it probably dries out and cracks. Bless you. Probably dries out and cracks as opposed to, you know, it's more of an age thing than it is. Um, we, we don't actually replace a lot of those. I mean, so. Uh, if it don't fail, so we just plumb around and just get rid of it. And, yeah, because the later TR sixes, for example, they, they just use a breather hose right off of the. Uh, just uh, put a little K and N, mini K and N. You could do something like that. Yeah, something breather. Yeah, I, mean, they, I think I think Moss still sells that diaphragm. Yeah. So you could you could always just replace it if that's. Yeah, I, I guess the thing about it is, I, I was suspecting my car was running lean, and thinking that that diaphragm was cracked, and uh, and then I started reading about that valve, gulp valve, and how it's tuned so that you know when they're plumbed straight into the carburetor, that the whole balance of the air fuel mixture is engineered around that valve working correctly. So is that a TR6 or MGB? Uh, that's a GT6. The 70. Yeah, okay. GT6. Because normally a gold valve would just introduce extra oxygen into the system, which would make the car shut off. So that's what it, it was originally designed to make the car run so lean that it won't run. And then that way it would just stop. So, um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's. I'm trying to think uh, the whole gold bag thing, but I don't know. I mean, we don't see them. We yeah, don't see them that often. We don't usually have too many issues with them. Anymore. Yeah, usually by now they're all plumbed around. Or, <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean you can leave them in place so it's original, but right. Go ahead. Yeah, and the other type of diaphragm to worry about is in the vacuum advanced retard mechanism. Those right. diaphragms are usually gone too. Right. And, and there's a pretty good source. I can't remember his name. He's up in. Uh, uh, what is it, uh, New Hampshire or someplace? That he's rebuilding all that stuff today, so you can you can get that. Yeah. But they you know, still I, make the original ones too. Yeah. They work just as well. But uh, uh, oil, uh, oil is uh, pretty important to our cars. Uh, we use a Brad Penn oil here. It's designed to work in the older engines with uh, lifters and so forth. Uh, it works very good for us. There's also, um, uh, there's an additive, ZDDP, which has a lot of the zinc and so forth that your, the cars need for lubrication. The uh, oil today is uh, pretty much designed to be catalytic converter friendly. So they've, they don't put a lot of that stuff in there. The newer oils also will scrub some of that stuff out of there. So um, that's why we go with the Brad Penn. There's, I mean, just about, I don't know how many different motor oils there are out there that you can use in your car. Uh, just about everybody sells something that's, uh, we talked about last year, like John Deere or yeah. something. Um, so Rotella. Um, there's, there's a bunch of different oil out there that's very good for your car, but I would, I would just assume, just assume see you use something like that rather than um, modern oil is what I'm trying to say. You want the zinc, you want the zinc in it, right? Yeah, you want all the lubrication you can. Yeah, because it's just, it just will make the engine last longer. I have a question, I'm, I'm running an alloy valve cover and it does not have a baffle when you buy the alloy valve covers. Do I need to put a, um, some kind of divert, uh, baffle in there to keep the oil from running into the car more than it normally would? Is a baffle necessary? Uh, I don't know. Not the valve cover. Like TR6? Yep. Do you ever see the way the rocker uh, oils on the TR6? It takes forever for it to get there to begin with. And it's not splash lubrication. It's just sort of, it just kind of, it, it oozes, kind of sort of oozes, oozes out. out. Right. So we're <coughs> not spraying a lot of, it's, it's, it's going to be more um, in, a, in a vapor form than in a liquid form. I, okay, because I, I know the like, original cover has that baffle there, and I just didn't know. To a certain degree, it's going to be under vacuum. Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to maybe periodically just pull that hose off that goes from the valve cover to the intake manifold and just double check that. Just see if there's how much residue is in there. So if you pull that off and you've got oil in there, then the thing to do would be to put some kind of a um, baffle sure, or sure. Yeah, whatever. Just
generally it's not needed though. You know, I, I don't I don't think so. But is it going to hurt the car? The, that extra oil? No, it's just going to you know you're just going to you're burning it right. You're yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you may you may have a you'd have to check your plugs once in a while maybe more frequently. So if all that stuff is okay, then you're probably okay. thank you. Matt, can you just touch on the viscosity? Uh, That's a weak foil has it. But I mean, what what do you guys? Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with going by what the manufacturer says. So if we're if we're typically going to service a, an MGB or a TR6, something of that nature, a little newer car, we'll put a 1040 in there. If we're working on a TR3, maybe a TD, TC, you know, they probably put in a 2050, and then uh, you can certainly get away with both. Uh, the if you're if you have an overdrive transmission, uh, they tend to. If you look in the JAG book, if you look in the MGB book, if you look in the Triumph book, whatever, they, they all specify a different, you know, Triumph is 80W90. Um, I'm trying to think, MGB is at 30 weight? 2050. 20, so there's, there's, there's all sorts of different things out there. Uh, we primarily use 80W90, it's a GL4. GL4, it won't attack the brass. So um, that's pretty much what we do. <coughs> um, I don't know that, that breaking it down too much more. What oil do you recommend on the stronger cars? I use automatic transmission fluid, uh, just regular <coughs> ATF. It, um, it has a good overall viscosity. Uh, but it's um, uh, they sell that you can you can you can order that oil uh, dash pot oil whatever you want to call it. Um, I just find and you could you could you can put thirty weight in there. You can put um, whatever you want in there, and it will affect the way the pistons obviously are going to move up and down. Um, I just think the automatic transmission fluid seems to be a good viscosity for that, where it's not too thin, it's not too heavy. It works in the winter, works in the summer, and you know, I, I think the biggest thing to do is if you keep having to put oil in the carburetor, um, there's a little seal at the bottom of it. And you know, it's kind of a pain in the ass to change, but it's not the end of the world. Um, they get hard, they crack, they, they can't hold the oil. So I, you know, we change a bunch of those during the course of the year, just, you know, to, so you don't have to change, you don't have to keep checking out. But yeah, the level for the dash pots. Basically, you drop the cap in, and it goes down, and maybe is like a, a quarter of an inch from the body, and then you just let it drop down by itself. It's you know, it, it's all by sight kind of thing. You know, you can you can you can. It'll seek its own level anyway because there's a yeah. leak hole at the top. So eventually, the piston will reach its maximum height, and then it will force the oil out that's in the way, and it sets the level. So I think the big thing is to follow that rule that you're thinking of. You could take, you could, you could fill it up maybe halfway, let's say, and that might be a little overfull. But if you fill it up halfway, put the uh, plunger in there, and then just listen to it. So you want to make sure when it goes in there that you hear that like suction noise, and whatever you want. That resistance. Yeah, you got to feel that resistance, right. and then, and then you're fine after that. I, I. Uh, uh, that's usually how I do it. You know, it's all, I, I still have to, you know, take it off, look in there, put some in, you know, and, and you just, it's by sight, you know. I've never looked in there. <laughs> <laughs> you should. You should. I just want to drop it. You know, I've never had that. Well, you know, I think the last time when, when we did some work for him a while back, but, you know, we would have made sure that it was full. Well, so you don't have to check it right now. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, go ahead. If you put too much oil, it just squirts out. Yes. Right. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. But uh, getting back to lubrication, uh, I don't like to let my cars sit for more than a week, week and a half. And because when you start them up, you know you're getting some valve batter. The oil isn't pumped up there. But I had pretty good luck with a car called Rizalone. 
And I was always impressed to go on the motor to the, to the in Napa and they had the little gears in the little plastic box and one was gummier than the other. And I really think there's something to that stuff. That you throw a little bit of that in your oil and uh, when you start it up, uh, you don't hear the clatter. Is that, uh, is that the glue is already sticking? Is that engine yeah. oil? I put it in the oil and I add the oil. Yeah, the oil. Yeah, it's like it's some of the tracks that you have. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. I don't know if anybody else has had the experience with it, but I think it works pretty well. Okay. For having that dry. Yeah, I I don't um, um, I don't really have any experience with it, but I mean if it's working and it keeps the oil on the moving parts, then you know that's the best thing you can do. Somebody that doesn't drive cars. Six cars in the the channel is dry. You know, that's probably one of the most important things you can do is use your cars. Uh, we get we get cars every year in here that the uh, customer does not use the car enough and it just, you know, succumbs to everything that's, you know, bad fuel and the, the brakes start to leak and, oh, mice, yeah. I don't even really want to go there. Uh, yes. Is it, is it necessary to retort the six bolts on the, uh, I guess it's the rear hub? I think they're 16 foot-pounds. On the six bolts? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. You, you know, normally they're not a lot nuts, so you know, if, if you... Oh, they're nuts. Yeah. They're nuts, right. It's right. a nylock nut. Once they're on, you should be good, because that's the reason to use a nylock nut. Yeah. But on the same token, it's in to an aluminum housing. Yes. So you, you just... And I don't and want to tell them... And it's a fine oh, thread. Stupidly, right. Which is like the worst thing possible. Yeah, I don't like so that. you want to pull stud it. You can check them. But you don't want to over tighten them because you'll just pull the threads. You know, if you try to smoke that down like a normal nut, you'll pull the threads right out of the drill. I went to 16, but I, I just don't know if it's a yearly thing you need to check. Because I, I worry those six nuts keep your keep your rear wheel on. Yes, and it's like that's scary. Six little stupid nuts. But you know, four four little nuts keep the fire on. Well, but they're much much more coarser, and much more robust. Yeah. These things are just fine aluminum threads. You know, if it falls out, you'd be the first to know. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll, and if you're behind me, you'll know too. <laughs> uh, a long time ago, I used to work on tractor trailers. And um, you can tell when a, when a nut is loose. You can tell, I'm not talking about money. <laughs> you, can, you can tell when a bolt is loose. So if, if you if you look at a bolt and it's loose, you're, you're going to know it's loose even before you go up to it. You don't have to turn it. You don't have to do anything. So I think if you keep that in your mind and you look at, you know, you're going to see, you might see a little bit of rust. You might there's going to be some kind of witness mark on there that's going to tell you that that bolt is loose. So you can look at you can look at your dry shaft bolts. You can look at your shock bolts. You can look at whatever you're looking at. And if you see if you see that little bit of uh, discoloration. You, you believe me. If, if you see one, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But you, so, but that particular one, um, the, again, they're nylock nuts. It'd be kind of hard to. But not to say nylock nuts don't go bad, because uh, a lot of times on the back of a TR6, let's say, um, a lot of our dry shafts would have nylock nuts on them. But they'll get old and they'll back off. It's not uncommon to see a TR6 with rear shafts that are clunking. And the reason they're clunking is because the bolts, the, the nuts came loose. So, um, you know, that's not uncommon at all. But to answer your question, I just, it would be, if you wanted to put that onto some kind of routine maintenance where you're gonna check it once in a while, yeah, it can't, can't hurt. hurt. Anything you do can't hurt to, yeah. and just let us know when you go down the road, because we'll, we'll, we'll drive ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll stay back. <laughs> stay back. Okay. Yeah, we'll stay back. Um, in, in the overdrive, uh, I read a lot of recommendations uh, about the oil, and I one of them that made sense to me was the 30 non-detergent. I got a tractor supply, and I and I put it in there, and the thing's been running fine. But I'm wondering what kind of uh, fluid do you guys use? Uh, well, as I said, I I pretty much use. Um, uh, 80, 80 W90, which really has a viscosity of uh, 20 W50. So you could you could certainly use that. I'm not a big fan of synthetic oil. 
I, I don't think because of the, the you know this let's say this is well this is a brake ring from an A type overdrive and uh, what what clamps on here is like a like a brake shoe not like this but same type of same type of material so it grabs this grabs this brake ring but I guess what I'm getting at is if it's if it's ultra slippery I, I just I, I think you need that that type of friction in order to make this work correctly. You don't want it any more slippery, if I can be correct, than than you than you want it to be. I mean, that's just you know this is an opinion. So, uh, and I have a bunch of opinions. You can ask my wife. <laughs> but uh, so you can use. I, I don't know whether there is a, a wrong oil per se, because when you, as I said, you know before about looking at the different. Um, manuals, you know, they're all talking about <coughs> some kind of different oil to some degree, but you know, is it actually going to matter? You know, it, it, it's, it's and, and some share oil with the, let's say, with the engine. So you've got your transmission oil, well, it's the same thing as the engine. So um, I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. 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 So, I, I don't think I, I don't think you can put. So if that oil is working out for you and everything seems to be fine, I, I don't see I don't see why you couldn't use it. Well, you know what it is is that these uh, modern cars use a lighter oil. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Back in the day, everything was you know, 90 weight, right? And now with with the 30 weight in there, the thing shifts beautifully. So, and the, and the overdrive is, you know, going in and out beautifully. So, I'm just wondering, can the 30 weight take the, am I going to see like in three years that the, uh, the gears couldn't take the, the I, pressure? I might be able to help. Yeah. I, I got an overdrive from John Escobedo at Quantum Mechanics yeah. about, I don't know, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, he swears by the 30 weight non detergent. And I've been using it ever since, and I've never had a problem. Thank you. So, there you go. Yeah. Now we have a yeah. one case. One case. That's your endorsement, right? Well, Joe and Escobedo. And you have an English car and shit. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Did it, did it take you 20 years to get that transition from John? No, no, no. The Ford I put in my GT. Nobody heard me say that. Uh, so did that answer your? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions? I mean, go ahead. I just want to make a comment. People were talking about the valve platter on startup, and there's a kit made where you can put an extra line in, and it feeds oil up to the top. Right. It'll stop the valve platter, but one of the problems you often run into is your oil consumption will go way up. Because and you'll have uh, you'll see oil off the back end be spoke because it sucks around the valve guides. You have too much oil up at the top, so I, I wouldn't recommend doing that kit to solve that problem. I'll I ended up removing it. John just won't. I, I don't recommend that as a cure for the valve. Guide. Okay, isn't the climate caused by the, the original oil? The original oil canister. Well, the TR6 draining out. The, the, the TR6 has an inherent problem in that it doesn't. The oil is is difficult to get to the head. So there's a, there's a fuel pump. There's actually a spiral machine in the back cam bearing, which acts like an oil pump to push it up. But it's just a tiny little groove, and it takes a little time to do oil to get there. I mean, in the engine will run a good five minutes before you start to see oil on and then it's still got to work its way up to the front. I don't have clatter, so I guess I'm doing something right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. While we're talking about oil, uh, do you uh, like the idea of a spin-on oil filter conversion? Uh, because I read some stuff that said because of the right angle in there, the angle, you're not really getting the full oil pressure all the time. I, I don't know if that would be uh, something to worry about in normal driving, but like in, in excessively hard driving. That I, I don't... To me, there's no problem with putting a, an adapter. If you want to spin on oil filter, then there's no problem with doing that. Because if you look at the MGB, I think that oil filter is upside down. So it's it's just, you know, I, I wouldn't follow that. 
thought. You know, I just, if you want one in there, it shouldn't be a problem. You're going to have the same amount of pressure no matter what's in there. So it should, it shouldn't, I mean, the oil filter doesn't care. So it doesn't really, you know, you're going to have the same pressure. So, I mean, certainly it makes it easier. <coughs> you know, if you have a TR6 or something like that. I mean, yeah. We've seen people drill holes through the, the inner fender wells, I mean, just everything, trying to get to that skipper. <laughs> so it, it's actually, it's, it's beneficial to me to have that. One more time, TR6, oil. What did you suggest then? We normally put 1040 in there. We use a Brad pen, uh, something that's engineered more so for the older cars. It seems to be a good overall, good overall in this area, in this environment. It seems to be good. It, it works well in the summer. It works well in the winter. You can readily get that red pin in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, yeah. It's been, it's, I mean, I think it's got a new name now, but it's, it's still. If, if you if you Google it, it'll come up as to somebody in your area. I mean, not a shameless plug. We carry it, but the bottom line is that you can buy it. I mean, Ken Ken carries it, so whatever. Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I run uh, a Casserole 2050 raising yeah. oil in, in my six because it supposedly has you know higher levels of zinc in it. Is there any <laughs> negative in running that racing oil in, in, in a six? No. no. You know, we used to use we used to have we used to buy Casserole 20 W50 way back. You know, and because it was it had all the good stuff in there. And then, and then they kind of re-engineered it, so it, it lost that good stuff. And uh, but it was a great, that was a great oil. Yeah, and depending on what bottle you open, it's different colors. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same, you know, it's the same manufacturer, same. The label is exactly the same. One is golden brown, and the other one is just as clear as you know, clear as it can be. So it's a lot of, I think, a lot of their manufacturing process and their feedstocks that. that Dictate those differences. Also, so I've noticed some of it smells a little bit burnt. So it suggests to me that in either they overcooked it when they were making it, or, they, <laughs> or it, whatever, whatever the feedstock came from. Uh, there was another. Yeah, Bill. Yeah, uh, Matt, as a some information about that using the racing oils. Um, Tim Miranda uh, is uh, a guy who. Uh, who engineers uh, oil, he did it for Castrol. Uh, I don't know if he's still there, but uh, he's, uh, he engineers racing oils. And he said, you don't want to put racing oil in street car because what it lacks are the additives uh, for long-term use. They, they designed the race oil for, you know, once they're on the track and, you know, one race and that's it. So it's, it, it doesn't have the, uh, the, the, the long length of time of dur dur durability. It, it doesn't have the acid to reduce acids. And a lot of people That's good. I did four that. point suppressors because everybody needs their four point suppress as much as possible. And all that other stuff. So, yeah, I can see that, sure. Yeah. And I mean, this is from a guy who you know, should know because he, you know, he designs the, the NASCAR oils and the, uh, the oils for. Uh, um, for the drag strips. Well, the thing of it is, though, you'll never really know if it was good or bad until you break the engine and have to take right. the parts. You're also in mind that, you know, like, obviously, a lot of these cars you're not driving every day, day in, day out. You know, a lot of this analysis on the other ones, I mean, I'm not what you're saying, but, um, you know, a lot of that, like, if you're running race runs, you're only putting, you know, five, yeah. 500 miles, yeah. or so I don't really know if that's really going to hurt anything. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I understand what you say. But they're going to do 500 miles on a split mile every time they go over a race. So, yeah, compensation, you got all that. It's not stress it down. It's not stress it down. It's also a good idea. So, I guess if you go around the block, you're fine. <laughs> but I, I, I still think, you know, Bill was saying it's probably correct, but I don't know how, because what Shane was saying, if you don't use your car that much, then. No I, I can't, I just don't know how. Well, I'm a little concerned about the lack of exactly, the lack of lack corrosion and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you could, you could, you could, you could just switch yeah. to that. I'll just tear the engine apart and look, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly it. Uh, Where's good? Uh, Where are we finished? Yeah, that's really
about that. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know a whole lot about that motorcycle. Uh, Peter was asking about the motorcycle. It's um, other than it's a 1912 or 1914 Reading Standard uh, that actually it has a belt on it. Some of them have a chain. That one has a belt. Um, it belongs to a customer that we're doing some we're doing some fab work to it. So um, they were made in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't really know that much about it, but are, are you chopping it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it was originally. I think they used to race a lot of that stuff, and in in the correspondence of a hundred years, people have done different things to that motorcycle that you know the the present owner wants to put it back into its original form. There's um, and I think who's going to the Boyertown Museum? Were you guys doing a board yeah. next weekend or something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they have one of those there. Uh, so you'll see, if you walk in there, there's one that's restored that's, that's actually in that museum. So, yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I have a question about coolant and your um, uh, thoughts on waterless coolant versus standard air um, I've been told that the waterless coolant, which I run in another car, eliminates the corrosion issues that I was having with that car. There's no water, so you've got to get your antifreeze completely out of there and do that. Um, so far, after three years, that car has been pretty good. <coughs> but, um, I just wondered how you felt that worked on British Do you want to answer that? Uh, well, I've looked into it because I was looking at using it in my stag because stags are notorious for cooling system issues. And frankly, uh, I can't find enough benefit to uh, stomach the cost. It's expensive. Because it's $50 a gallon yeah. and you're looking at two and a half, three. three gallons, give or take. Plus, plus the, the, the flush. Yeah. And, you know, okay, it's supposed to eliminate corrosion issues because take the water out of it. And it's supposed to eliminate the expansion and boil over problems because you're operating fluid that, that boils at 350 or 400 degrees as opposed to 200 degrees. Um, That's where I see the benefit in my other okay. vehicle because I was having problems. Yeah, it tends to run a little cooler because you don't have the right. boiling inside. But I, I, couldn't, I couldn't justify the cost for what apparent benefit there was, and it didn't seem to be. It wasn't a, a compelling enough reason to spend that kind of money for a tiny little game. We, uh, on, to take that one step further, we installed that in a customer's car, a TR6. Uh, he wanted to try it, fine. We, uh, we had to buy, because you can only buy it a gallon, so you have to buy three gallons. Uh, put it in his car. Uh, it lasted for about two weeks. And uh, he just he couldn't deal with it. It just was not working in that car. So I, that's my really only experience with that stuff. Is and it, and it was kind of a negative experience. Gotcha. What do you mean it wasn't working? Um, he had he had overheating issues. So uh, you know most of our cars, you know you could put ten of them together and they're all going to be different. But his car. Um, he just he couldn't drive it, you know. It would just overheat. So uh, he had this was down at the shore, but he had a, a shop, you know, take it out and uh, flush it, get as much because you're never going to get all that stuff out. I mean, it's, it would be impossible. But so he took it out and we uh, uh, he put regular antifreeze back in and he's <coughs> car's fine. So. I, that's my been my only experience with that stuff. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't recommend it only for that reason. I, but if it's working for you, then you know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Tom. It works great for my car. You guys, you built the engine. That's all I put into it. You built it. See, I've never seen the temperature change go above the first day. Yeah. So, so there you go. I mean, it's it's. It is what it is, so that's good. And he has a TR6, so. Does, um, I use that water wet. 
my in my TBR. That actually well, basically dropped. that just uh, plays around the surface engine. Right, and it it had a dramatic impact. And it was cheap. You could put a bottle of it in. Yes. The way it went. Yeah, I thought that had some little snippet in there about how to drain the antifreeze, or did you just put it in? Just put it right in there. Yeah, it mixed itself. All right. Uh, we have bottles of that over there. We don't use it all the time, but um, uh, we do put electric fans in to try to circumvent some of that stuff. And, and that we're putting in more aluminum radiators than we ever used to. So that that seems. And that was to in be the TR6 engine. In the in the TBR. I've always found yeah. to keep the TR6 engine and the coolant system top right as much as you can squeeze in it, it'll work just fine. But if you let it get down an inch, it'll try to run hot. Really? Uh, at at this point. I, I do have to make a special announcement, and um, uh, we have a customer here today, his name is uh, George Swanger, and it's actually his birthday today. So, George's TR4 is back there, we're about ready to uh, deliver it, not another shameless plug. That's George. George, could you raise your hand for me, please? That's George. Today, so we can have cake. We're gonna have ice cream though, so I, you know, I didn't want to make a big enough cake for everybody. <laughs> oh, fuel injection in that TR250 back there. <coughs> and uh, Mike put the same system in his stag. I was going to let him do a little bit of talking. We're getting more and more <coughs> questions about it as you know, a way to get away from the uh, uh, typical Strummer carburetor. Uh, they also make some for the earlier cars. But um, the, the car runs very well. I will say, um, uh, I will say that. It, it's, it's, it, you know, I'm always a little skeptical. I'm, I'm not a big, you know, try something new type person. I just assume not re-engineer the wheel. But um, that seemed to do very well. And uh, uh, Rob put his laptop on there, you can plug it in. And uh, so they're playing with that. Uh, and, yeah, gonna, okay. Uh, a very short history lesson. A couple, well, 20 odd years ago, they added methyl terbutyl ether to gasoline, MTBE. And they used that as an oxygenator. And the idea behind that was to put a little extra oxygen into the fuel charge in an attempt to reduce emissions. The problem with MTBE is it's poisonous. You get gasoline on your skin, you can actually absorb it through your skin. And uh, there was major issues with groundwater contamination because all fuel tanks leak, they're buried in the ground. So while it, it helped big cities make their air quality uh, numbers, uh, in the end it really wasn't the best stuff. So at some point, some person way smarter than myself figured out, hey, let's use ethanol. And it turns out ethanol does the same kind of thing because it brings in about 3.5% added oxygen to the, uh, to the party. Uh, so it, it does the same thing. It reduces emissions. Uh, it's not poisonous unless you drink it. Um, relatively inert once it gets out into the atmosphere, it evaporates easily and there's, uh, you know, it's it, more environmentally friendly. However, alcohol absorbs water. So when you get water and condensation in the fuel system, it tends to attract that and then pull it into a little corner and creates an acid which eats nice soft aluminum parts like the stuff that carburetors are made out of. And it wouldn't be uncommon to take an old carburetor, take it apart, and find it completely salted up inside with aluminum salts because that's just kind of what that stuff does. Um, not to mention rubber. Yeah, not to mention rubber. In our cars, what we notice are things like fuel boiling on a hot day. Uh, I don't know if TR6 owners have noticed this, but I have. You're sitting in traffic, it's 80 degrees outside, and all of a sudden the engine starts running really, really lumpy, 
loses power big time, and then eventually just stalls. Um, you wait a little while, things cool down, starts right back up, and it's happy again. Um, but if you have a clear fuel filter, you'll see air bubbles going through the filter, and that's the fuel actually boiling on its way to the engine. I had the same issue with my stag, because the fuel lines run inside the frame rails against the engine and the exhaust system and all the things that produce heat. Uh, the other problems with ethanol, you, get, you have power loss because uh, there's, not enough, there's not as much gasoline. You know, alcohol is, 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 it does burn, but not to the, uh, not, doesn't have the power, uh, the stored chemical energy that gasoline does. Um, to get around to those problems, you need to run premium fuels, and premium is kind of expensive compared to even mid-grade gasoline. And the big thing at the end of the day, if you really want to get your car to run the way it was supposed to run, the way it was originally designed, is you need to reject the carburetor. So it's, again, all this stuff that uh, we do here just to try to circumvent the problems that these today's fuels, um, <coughs> these today's fuels produce. One of the, and I'll stop here right now, we don't work for a patent machine. We don't endorse their product as such. Um, and we gain no financial advantage from using their stuff, but we've used their stuff and it's really good. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but you know, you, the reader, can make up your own mind. So um, the great thing is about fuel injection, it's adaptable to the various fuels because it has an O2 sensor in it, so it's always looking at what the engine's doing and making adjustments at the front end to keep uh, Keep the air fuel ratio on target because it's, there's an assumption that just catalytic converter beyond that, and the catalytic converter needs a feed gas of a certain ratio so it to do its job as effectively as possible. Uh, these systems are OBD compatible. They have some onboard diagnostics. It's not near, nearly what it is OBD2 as it is today. So therefore, I don't need a code reader, but um, it, it is smart enough to give you some information at least. Um, it really doesn't have any temp temperature sensitivity, so you don't have problems with um, you know, parking a hot engine on a hot day and waiting for all the fuel to evaporate from the carburetor, and then for the next hour, the car absolutely won't start because it's completely loaded up with gasoline. Uh, you have very good drivability, especially when cold. And um, the system that we use, uh, the patent machine system, it's all GM parts. It's all General Motors Generation 1 throttle body fuel injection parts. So that if a map sensor gives up or a temperature sensor goes south, I can go down to AutoZone and get that part. <laughs> and there's no carburetor dash pots to deal with. So, yeah. so um, and as part of the system, you re replumbing some of the, uh, the way the fuel is delivered to the engine, so you start to eliminate some of those fuel boiling issues as well. So, and the system is somewhat adaptable, so again, ethanol fuels aren't going to bother it so much. So, the full kit as you would normally buy. Well, first off, the kit is built by uh, affordable fuel injection. They provide the computer, wire harness, all the various and sundry sensors, and I think some of the installation instructions, I don't re recall that there's a little bit of overlap in there. Um, but then, um, patent machine buys all those bits and offers up uh, bracketry, and adapters and other rods and ends to, to be able to put the sensors on places where you need it. For example, there's a throttle position sensor, which requires a bracket, which bolts it right up to the carburetor. Um, and then he's got an adjustable fitting that makes that connection to the, to the sensor. So that you're not fiddling around trying to make parts. He's, he's already done all the hard work for you. And it's, some of it's rather genius the way he's worked it out. But anyway, the full kit includes um, <coughs> A distributor modification that converts it to solid state. A high pressure fuel pump, which I think is good, maxed out as about 25 psi. You need uh, most of the systems are going to require about 15 to get it done. So the old SU click click type uh, fuel pump isn't going to be enough. They only put out probably at maximum maybe 10, um, because carburetor only needs about 4 psi maximum. Anything beyond that, you're just going to start flooding the carburetors. Um, you get the injector bodies with an adapter. Uh, the idea is you've got the carburetor, you take the piston assembly out of the carburetor, right. and then you put the injector assembly in that space. And then uh, 
it's assumed you've run the carburetors dry, you just disconnect the fuel line, plug the fuel inlet because otherwise you have a big air leak. And uh, basically that's like the total of the modifications of the carburetor itself. What do you do with the excess fuel? Does that, there's no return line on that. Yes, there is. Okay. Yeah, that's the fuel pressure regulator handles that. So you have a fuel pressure regulator, that's a big green, uh, big red thing with a, a gauge on it. Um, <laughs> You're supplying fuel to it, any excess at the set point is sent back to a return line. So a lot of times when you refit these, you, you leave the original fuel line in place and replumb that and use it as a return line. Um, Do you have to modify the tank then? No. Usually you use a vent, one of the vent plugs. I guess if it's a really early car, like a three that doesn't have much of a vent, you'd have to do something. But like a Stag or a TR6, they've got, there's 101 fittings on the top of the tank for venting and you know, charcoal, canister, emulsion, and all that jazz. So you just borrow one of those and put the return line in that. So you always have fuel in circulation. Um, anyway, then it also then the kit includes the engine management unit, the wire harness, all the various and sundry temperatures, like throttle position, temp temp throttle position sensor, temperature sensors, and a manifold absolute pressure sensor. Uh, you get installation and setups all, all on a CD. Uh, various and sundry instructions. You get a little bitty manual. <laughs> but it's got pictures and a good description of what things do. And um, cat converter? Does it have to have a cat converter? No. Okay. No, it does not. Because our cars don't have to eat that problem. Right. They don't have that problem. Hey, just one more thing. Yep. Difficulty, as in one to ten. Um, and how long did this take you to put that install? I'd, I'd give it a nine. It is a little bit, there's a little bit nine, too. Nine of difficulty or nine of ease? Nine of difficulty. It, it is a little bit involved in it, I will admit that. If you get on his website, there's a pictorial of yeah. every section. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, just for the masses, you know, just so, uh, so you're not going to do this in the afternoon. Pictures. No. But they're claiming over the weekend, and uh, no, you got to you got to take the gas tank out and the, uh, put a weld and exhaust sensor. Yeah, you need you need the weld and exhaust. But it does give you the bong that welds into the pipe. You just have to figure out where it's a good place to put it. On the stag, I had issues because I really wanted to put it between the, the cross pipe, but it would have put it so far back, and there wasn't any room around the transmission for this this probe to stick out. So it just ended up in one of the downpipes. Looks a little intimidating to me. <laughs> I, approached, I approached it one at a time. Okay. Okay. Let's find out find a good home for the computer. Okay. There's a good spot. Now I need to poke through the bulkhead here. And once I got the harness out into the engine bay, it's like, okay, we'll put this sensor here and that sensor there and wire it along this way. And it just kind of, it was a bit organic. It just kind of grew based on where I thought things needed to go. The ultimate uh, goal was, I didn't want it to be obvious. I wanted the car to have fuel injection without it looking like you know, it had all these parts <coughs> everywhere. I wanted it to look like it was born there. So anyway, his, his directions that he does give you, you're correct, he does, uh, breaks down a couple of areas like, Converting the distributor, and you know he'll take uh, feedback from some of his customers and say, "Well, this is how I did it. This is where I put the fuel pump, and this is where I did all these other things." Um, so he he does offer a lot of uh, a lot of good insight, and um, you know it was, it was a good place to start. But uh, you know at the end of the day, I got the kit sometime in April. And it took me better part of a month and a half of just working on it in the evenings. So no, no weekend. There's no weekend job. I, I probably so. got eight hours just trying to figure out where to hang the fuel pump and how to <laughs> run the fuel lines. Uh, you know, you drill a lot of holes and bend a lot of tubing trying to get things where you want it. You I know, we had uh, Joe McDonald back there, and he was he worked for us part time for a little bit, but. He's, he was the one that started that um, installation project. And what Mike is saying is true. You know, you got this stuff and you have to put it into the car in the best way possible. And, and it's, sometimes it can get kind of precarious in a way because you, uh, you can't hide it. In that, in that engine bay, there's just no place to hide it. So it just, maybe the stag is a little bit easier because it's got some caverns yeah, in there. Yeah. But, uh, that car was a little different. It just, you know, everything's there, and now that it's painted white, of course everything shows up. So there's, there's, there's no way to kind of hide it so much. But you know, 
Joe and I, you know, when we were laying this whole thing out, I mean, it was, okay, where do we put this? Where do we put that? How do we run this line? How do we do that? So, yeah. It's, yeah, to be fair, I mean, uh, when it came to putting the uh, idle air control servo in place, I moved it twice until I had it in the location. Uh, number one, it was a little bit hidden. Number two, that I get a drill to it so I could mount it. And number three, that I could plumb it without having hoses running all over creation. Um, but anyway, getting back to this, uh, once you run the harness, the harness is kind of a generic harness. It's got all the connectors on it, but if you run it the way it was initially produced, you're going to have big coils of harness tucked in certain corners. There's a lot of um, extra wire. I found a company, uh, because I knew it was General Motors stuff, and I know that General Motors is both GM, Delphi, and Packard Electric, I Googled the question, Delphi Packard Electric Connectors, and I found a company called Ballinger Motorsport, and they had a really nice website, they had pictures of all the connectors, and I said, that one, and that one, and I bought a pack of connectors as well, just to see, does this match up? And I got the pins that I needed, so therefore I could take the harness apart, modify this length as needed, and it's, everything fits the way it's supposed to be now. So it's an, it, it, it forms up a nice clean installation, um, if you take the time to, to make it look that way. Do they want the computer put in the cockpit or out in the engine bay? There's really no restriction. Uh, heat? Um, but probably heat is a big issue. I did make one change, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, I don't, because it's Gen 1 stuff, I was a little concerned about, I mean, if you've ever taken a Bosch Metronic computer apart and opened it up, I mean, I think it's, it's a thing of beauty. Oh, I do that every time. I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and today's engine management computers and all that stuff, it's, it's all potted in, so it can't be attacked by the atmosphere. This is why we like Mike so much. Here. <laughs> this is why we like him so much because he comes up with these things like, you know, how does a paper clip, clip work? And, you know, hey, if you don't have anything to do, why don't you take this computer apart and look at it? It's like, well, yeah, okay. But sometimes we get frustrated by stupid things like the parts of the hardware that held it together. But anyway. Um, you locate all the various and sundry sensors, make the modifications to the distributor, locate the fuel pump assembly. Like I said, that was probably the biggest one because I spent better part of eight hours on the car figuring out, okay, here's a good place to put the fuel pump because I have an issue with fuel pumps in the car. Something goes horribly wrong. You've got sparking and fuel right there. And uh, at least I figured, noise. yeah, and they make noise. This uh, is electric. I, I will give that a good uh, fuel pump they gave you, it's a, it's a motor type, uh, it does have a little bit of a hum to it, but uh, try to isolate it as best as possible, and it's not too bad. Yeah, we put that one in there, we had to isolate it, because yeah. I think when we first turned it on, it was... Yeah, they, they, give, you a, they give you a C-clamp with a rubber gasket around the inside of it, so you've got some isolation, but I mounted mine on an aluminum plate and on, on rubber feet, and that cut, cut it even further. Um, so once you do all this work, uh, plumb it up and connect it, this is, the, this is where it starts to, this is where you begin to reap the benefits. Uh, the normal ignition setting on a Triumph is four degrees after top dead center at idle, uh, which makes the engines kind of sluggish, uh, but that's done for emissions purposes mostly. Uh, the more time you can put into the engine is up to what the fuel will tolerate is just working to your advantage because you're giving, you're getting more energy out of that fuel. Uh, when you hit it real late with a spark, it's, the piston's already heading down when you finally set it on fire, which means it's still burning when the piston's coming up and it's pushing fire and raw fuel and burning fuel out the exhaust pipe. And that's done to reduce NOx emissions. Well, uh, this setup calls for 18 degrees before top dead center. Now I'm putting a fair amount of timing into the engine, so right away I get a benefit from that. Um, and once you set the throttle position sensor, you're done. It's pretty much straightforward. Um, it, like I said, it does have OBD1 capability. You don't need a set, you don't need a, uh, a scan tool. You need one of those, just a paper clip. Uh, you short two pins on a, on a connector and read the flashes on the check engine light and I'll tell you exactly what it's not happy with or what it seems is going on. Um, in mine, uh, not really being aware of it, I had to read the directions fully through. I set the throttle position sensor to zero. Now the car started and it ran okay, but I had a little, a little orange lights on all the time. And uh, once I read the directions and then scanned it, it came right up and said the throttle position sensor out of range. And I thought, okay. And then I went back and read the directions, like, oh, 
It's supposed to have a half a volt at, at idle position. Played around with the fitting, got the connection where it belonged. Check engine light went out immediately. Car runs fine. It starts, it idles dead on. Pulls like a train. I can pull out of the garage and drive right up the street. I'm not feathering the throttle, playing with the choke, waiting for it to warm up. Nothing started driving. So in those respects, it works just like a modern car, like we expect it to. Um, so it, uh, I mean, in my opinion, it's a good kit. Yes, it's, uh, it is somewhat labor intensive, but um, a friend of mine has a stag. He ordered his kit three days ago and said, uh, I'll call you when it comes in. my next job is. How much is it? How much is it? For my car, full up, which was the distributor, uh, all the parts for the distributor, and all the bits, full kit was $2,200. Okay, now the cylinders are cheaper. I think it's uh, about $1,800. Okay, yeah, you're in the two grand range, but for some reason, the V8 is a little more money. Though it's almost the same number of parts. Do you yes. get into the, uh, the, electric, the, the engine management to the point where you know what the polling order is for the uh, sensors? No. Nope. It's, it's, it's plug and play in that respect. And, but, I'm sorry, but, but um, you get two, I think two free upgrades. So if you've got a car that's modified with, say, it has, has, has headers on it, or a bigger compression ratio, or you board it out a little bit, they can actually flash a chip that will give you, you know, make, will make up for that, and you'll be able to take advantage of those modifications. So that's pretty nice that way. So you have it in the stack? Uh, I, have the, I have the stock set up in the stack, yes. So which side did you decide to put the O2 sensor? The O2 sensor is on the right-hand bank. Back near the transmission because you only need one. Right? In that case, yeah, I only have I only have a choice of one. Um, somebody mentioned something about relocating something. Uh, the um, ignition amplifier module uh, was provided with an aluminum plate to be mounted with a, to be mounted uh, sandwiched between the coil and the engine block. First time I drove the Stag, I couldn't touch that module. It was that hot, and I thought to myself. This is in the wrong place. The electronics are not allowed to get that hot. So I located that to the bulkhead, put that on the firewall. I'm much, I'm much more satisfied that that will last a long time. So, um, but that was about it. I mean, in the end, I'm very happy with what I ended up with. And uh, really, if anybody's considering it, uh, look into that. Uh, the, the, it turned out pretty good. Kit. Do they make that kit for the uh, Rover V8? Uh, they, they, they'll do it for Hitachi, SU, and Stromberg carburetors. So anything parked out in that driveway can have a kit fitted to it. Any other questions? And then we're all waiting for lunch. <laughs> um, before, before we break for lunch, well, before we have lunch, uh, I was going to going to hand out a fire extinguisher. Now anybody that's been here before knows that a fire extinguisher is very dear to my heart. Uh, Jeremy's a volunteer. I'm a volunteer. Josh is a volunteer. Josh is an EMT. I'm an EMT. So um, we, this, uh, this bracket was a borrowed idea from Mercedes-Benz. Thanks Mercedes-Benz owners. And it's designed to mount right here so that it's at hand Putting it in the trunk isn't going to do a whole lot of good if the trunk's on fire. But if it's right here, you can grab it on the way out the door. <laughs> so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to we're going to give uh, this fire extinguisher away. It's a Halotron fire extinguisher. Uh, liquid turns into a gas when it comes out. Very efficient. Takes away the oxygen. Puts the fire out. Halon, did you say? Halon. 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 Yeah. Halon. This is a little more environmentally friendly. Okay. And no, no mess, no mess in your engine. Okay? <coughs> this this yeah. is non-corrosive. This this is a gas. It comes out as gas. Non-corrosive. Works very well. Not a good cooling agent. Don't get excited. Yeah. Just pull the handle, put the fire out, and wait. That's all I can just tell you. Don't get excited. The uh, This is a dry chem. This is... Um, this is corrosive and makes an absolute mess. This is uh, 
it'll put the fire out, works on the same principle, smothers the fire, does a very good job, it's uh, very prevalent, it's very inexpensive, and um, works great, but if you put something out in this shop with this, we're going to have a pretty stern talking to you. <laughs> uh, so, bottom line is, this is a very good fire extinguisher, it works well, it's a good size, uh, it'll last for about uh, maybe seven, seven seconds, but uh, you can shoot it through the shoot it through the grill. You don't necessarily have to open up your hood. You certainly want to check before you open up your hood. But um, at any rate, um, you know the safety side of this. I would want to make sure that everybody has a working fire extinguisher in your car. And my premise is that. You have a working fire extinguisher so that you use it on your neighbor's car. <laughs> a lot of car shows require them. Yeah, not your car. So, yeah, well, we don't. Yeah, I've been to a lot of car fires, but so, so we're going to get them. Uh, yeah, we sell this. This is one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Seven seconds. Seven seconds. This will last for about seven seconds. And so one racing jigs. Yeah, good luck. Everybody, if you this want to chrome, you can that way too. And it's really just the manufacturer because this is $125 also, but you can obviously see the size difference. So you get more for your bag for this one. a little tiny fire. That. Yeah, well, the big thing is you want to call 911 <laughs> and then put the fire out. Uh, so, anyway, long story short, we're going to give that away today. And uh, Ella, Ella, we call her. She's going to, why don't you shake them up, I mean like really, really, really good. And do you want Mike to pick one or are you going to pick one? Okay, why don't you hand it to Mike? Yeah, I'm a disinterested party on the